And good evening. Uh, I'm Brent Glass, the executive director of the Sing Sing Prison Museum. Um, and welcome to our uh, latest program in our series that the museum calls Justice Talks. Um, the Sing Sing Prison Museum is uh, under development um, uh, in Ossining, New York, uh, right next to the Sing Sing Correctional Facility. Um, the museum is governed by a board of trustees and we have adopted the mission uh, the, to tell the story of Sing Sing prison over the last 200 years, 200 years of, of incarceration at Sing Sing, but also connect this history uh, and uh, to, the, uh, to contemporary issues and to challenge all of us to imagine a more equitable justice system and to build a better society. We want to challenge all of us to ask the question, why do we have prisons today? And why did we have prisons 200 years ago? Why did Alexis de Tocqueville visit uh, Sing Sing prison in 1831 and raise some of the same questions that we're raising today about our criminal justice system and about prisons in particular. The uh, Justice Talks programs uh, are inspired by this mission and were developed by one of our trustees, Sam North, who is a faculty member at uh, Ossining High School and also a, a member uh, of the board uh, at uh, Peekskill School Board. Um, Sam North um, developed this program as our senior producer, along with two of our wonderful staff members, uh, Victoria Gonzalez and Nicole Hamilton, who are producing tonight's program. The Justice Talks uh, programs have covered a wide range of, of topics, including policing, uh, the impact of COVID uh, on prisons, uh, wrongful convictions, solitary confinement, uh, family reunions, um, and also uh, capital punishment. We've also had po poetry readings, um, a black history program, and a program on the, on the women's prison uh, at Sing Sing, which existed uh, in uh, the 19th century. Tonight's program uh, concerns the uh, Attica prison uprising of September 1971. We will observe the 50th anniversary of that, uh, of that event uh, later this year. And we have a, a very interesting panel to help us understand the causes and the consequences of the Attica uh, prison uprising, and also uh, make the connection between that history, that event, and some of our um, uh, concerns about uh, incarceration uh, and uh, criminal justice today. Our panel, our panelists are Heather Ann Thompson, who is the author of the definitive work on the Attica uprising, and uh, her book, uh, Blood in the Water, which was published in 2016, uh, the Attica prison uprising of uh, 1971 and its aftermath. This book won the Pulitzer Prize, won several uh, awards for uh, an extraordinary amount of, of research and also uh, bring this, uh, this story together, not only the, the uh, events of September 1971, but also the aftermath, the investigations and the lack of investigations that occurred uh, over the last uh, 50 years. Heather Ann Thompson is a historian at the University of Michigan. She is very much involved in a number of, of projects concerning uh, criminal justice uh, research today. She, is, um, uh, she serves as an advisor to the widely acclaimed um, States of Incarceration Project, as well as an advisor to the Ford Foundation's Art for Justice Fund, and is a co-founder of the Carceral State Project with, with its um, documenting criminalization and confinement research initiative at the University of Michigan. Uh, our two other panelists were eyewitnesses to history. They were eyewitnesses to the events at Attica Prison in 1971. Tyrone Larkins uh, had his first, has had first person experience with the criminal justice system in New York. Larkins entered Sing Sing Prison in June 1970. He was later transferred to Attica Correctional Facility in January 1970 
where he, sur where he survived the uprising in September 1971. He acquired a college education at Marist College um, uh, while incarcerated at Greenhaven Correctional Facility. He was released via parole in 1997 after serving 29 years in prison. Our other panelist is David Rothenberg, the founder of the Fortune Society, one of the nation's leading reentry service organizations serving nearly, nearly 7,000 people uh, annually. He is also a uh, leading advocate for criminal justice reform and alternatives to incarceration. David Rothenberg uh, was a member of the Attica Observers Committee during the uprising in September 1971. So we will start our program with uh, Heather Ann Thompson giving us some uh, historical context to the uprising. I'm so I'm so glad to be here and I'm I'm particularly glad to be here sharing this event with uh, folks that were actually at Attica. I think that that is particularly fitting and I will do my best to introduce the importance of this event but um, but then forthwith turn it over to the folks that were there and they can share with you why this event is so important. Um, primarily, we are here because it's 50 years since essentially nearly 1300 men stood up for fundamental and basic human rights behind bars. And here it is 50 years later, and we are still uh, in a situation in America's correctional facilities where those fundamental and basic human rights do not exist. So we have this opportunity to talk about why that is. And Attica is a window into a moment when these men stood up and called the nation's attention as to what was going on behind bars. And this was a really an extraordinary struggle. Uh, nearly 1,300 men come together for four long days and four long nights, brought the media in, brought observers in, uh, such as David Rothenberg, uh, men such as Tyrone Larkin, inside uh, really shining light on what it means to do time in the United States and what it means to spend day in and day out inside of uh, cells that are tiny, what it meant in Attica to be fed on 63 cents a day, what it means to be in a system that is so raci racially disproportionate in terms of who's inside versus who's outside. And for four long days and four long nights, these men negotiated for more humane treatment. But meanwhile, outside, state troopers mobilized to retake that prison with force. And what I think you're gonna hear tonight is about the struggle to humanize the inside of America's prisons, but an equally important determination on the outside to resist that. And so this story that you're gonna hear about is, uh, is, a, is a dual sided story. It's about the importance of trying to, to make justice and the justice system really just and about a whole lot of energy that goes into keeping it inhumane and uh and there was a lot of legacies that come out of attica a lot of really important uh things improve out of attica but there was a lot of legacy of attica that we're still living with a lot of repression that we're still living with and so uh, I think that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. We're gonna talk about the kind of amazing things that brought these brothers together in the yard, that kept them going, uh, that, that kept the struggle going and the lawyers that descended on Attica to, to uh, fight for justice after Attica. Uh, and we're also gonna talk about what the legacy was, uh, the legacy of mass incarceration, the legacy of way too much solitary today, the legacy of way too many people behind bars today. Um, and we're gonna talk about the fact that even today, uh, the records on what happened at Attica remain closed, uh, that we still need these records open, that we still need uh, a measure of 
justice done for the atrocities that were carried out at Attica after uh, the brothers stood up for basic human rights. And, uh, and we need to talk about the fact that today in prisons across this nation, there's a whole, whole lot of people still suffering. Uh, so we still need uh, the legacy of what the brothers stood up for 50 years ago addressed uh, even this many years later. And so I think we have a lot to talk about today and, um, and Attica at 50 years is the perfect opportunity to revisit all of these things. The, the Attica brothers gave us a, a, a high bar uh, and, and, and a lot to be grateful for and a lot to still talk about and still, uh, still move forward on. Thank you, Heather, for setting that, uh, that context. Um, the uh, question that I, maybe I'll, I'll lead off, but I'd like you uh, to join in in the questions, questioning as well. But I'd like to ask Tyrone Larkins to, uh, to share uh, your experience, what you saw, what you experienced uh, that week at Attica Prison. Attica, okay. <clears throat> Let me put it in, in, in perfect context, because this is a lot, a lot, what I'm going to say now is, what, is a lot that is, is forgotten. 1970, what happened in 19, well, let's go back to the mid 60s where you had, hell no, we won't go, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And those was the cliches that Remind that told people they wasn't going to Vietnam uh, before an unjust, unjust war, and say it loud, I'm black and I'm brown was racial identity among black people, and when the combination uh, entered prison, when when the time I did, this is basically the attitude that was prevalent in Attica at that time, and there was a lot of antagonism. You know, you ask about the four days, it's not. It wasn't just the four days. It was everything that built up to those four days. In my opinion, based on what I seen, what I witnessed, and what I experienced, Attica was an old man's jail. It was the harshest prison in New York State at that time. I mean, you didn't communicate with correction officers or prison guards, as I should say. The only communication was a tap on the wall with the stick. One tap says go, two taps says stop. And basically that was it. You was called by your number and not your name. Uh, and that type of attitude or that type of formation um, didn't sit well with young people such as myself. I mean, when I went to Attica, I was only 22 years old, full of venom and full of a lot of hostility from being convicted of a crime. Um, in Kings County, uh, New, uh, Kings County, New York. And that whole racial thing of the majority, well, I wouldn't say the majority at that time in Attica was black, but you had a uh, uh, over present of black people in prison in Attica and the keeper, all the keepers was white. So that was an antagonism right then in, in itself. The jumper of uh, the play the little forward when the four days, uh, we talk about the 9th of uh, September, when the incident happened, because the incident actually happened on the 8th, when two guys was, uh, I, actually was horse playing in the yard, and correction officers tried to break it up. It didn't go well the way they wanted it to go. And that night, uh, the two individuals was taken to um, segregation, was called segregation, was at that time housing block Z. Uh, we call better known as the box. And when the next day uh, on the 9th, uh, an incident happened in the corridor where individuals was coming back from the chow hall and the place just blew up. I mean, I was I, at that time, I was assigned uh, to work in the metal shop painting cabinets, uh, spray painting cabinets. And the first thing I seen was that when I seen people from different blocks, into the mineral shop, I knew something was emphatically wrong because Attica was totally segregated. Attica was actually four prisons in one. You had four big cell blocks. 
that was segregated from one another and four big yards. And when I seen people from different cell blocks in the metal shop, and I'm hearing the escape siren going off on the wall, I said, well, this is it. And after the disorganization of the first day or the first half of the day, I should say, in um, in a, a, a D block yard, there became a sense of organization among people that was confined. And the issues started coming up, coming up concerning the degradation that we went through in prison at that time. And, and to clue you in, each convict at that time received a roll of toilet paper once a month. Uh, hear me, once a month you received a roll of toilet paper. And if that you ran out of that roll of toilet paper, you got to try to get some as best as you can. You got a bar of soap once every two weeks. You took a shower once a week. And this was in the course of the day where if you was assigned to school or working in one of the very shops in the prison, uh, time was allotted, uh, I think man, 45 minutes for you to take a shower. These are the, was the imposing points of degradations that we asked that be changed in Attica at that time. Um, a lot of other things was prevalent in terms of, um, of having uh, educational opportunities, uh, putting, providing better food, providing a little more uh, money for people that worked in the prison or as well as went to school. And to a large extent, uh, putting some type of programming into prison where a person can actually change itself, change themselves. And uh, none of these factors was there. Um, and I tell you what, this was the first time I slept under the stars in prison. It may sound humorous to you, but I, I, I remember the first night I looked up at the, uh, at the sky and I seen uh, all the stars and the moon and everything else. And I said, wow, is this really real? Even though I knew it was real, I had to pinch myself a couple of times. And it went on like this for um, four days, four days and four nights until um, I think Sunday night when you knew there was something was amiss, something was going to happen. Um, I remember waking up, uh, uh, sleeping on, on the ground Monday morning and it was a, a, a misty overcast over the prison yard, over the whole prison itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and you can actually feel it in your gut. Something is not right. Something, something is not right. I mean, the weather is even dictating that something is not right today. And I would say, I, I, I can't actually say what time it was. Uh, but it was in the morning, maybe after eight, nine, something like around that time. Um, a big green helicopter came over the prison yard and it said, lay down, put your hands on your head. You would not be harmed. But while saying it, saying that, that announcement, um, some type of gas was, uh, discharged from that helicopter. And that gas was so powerful, it literally cleaned my whole sign. I remember falling to my knees and everything that was in my si uh, sinus, um, sinus came out of me. It literally came out of me. And then the next thing I, know, I remember, uh, I seen the ground jumping up and down, uh, literally jumping up and down from the massive amount of bullets that was being shot into that yard. And um, yes, I did get shot numerous times. And um, I was one of the fortunate ones to uh, survive the shooting. And the fact of the matter is fortunate that the, uh, I believe it was uh, National Guard came and put me on the stretcher and took me out of the yard. And um, I woke up outside, not outside of the prison yard, but out not outside the prison, let me put on the, Point of clarity of that. I woke up outside of D Block Yard where every, a lot of crazy things was happening. But where we was located at, um, 
right next to the hospital or outside the hospital, I seen a string of men who was um, naked and being ushered to a uh, uh, housing block Z and they was being beat by sticks and everything. And that literally made me fall out again. I just fell out. And uh, that's what happened uh, in terms of uh, uh, the 9th of September, 1971 to uh, the 13th of September, 1971. Wow. Well, can I and I was just going to jump in. I know that David will jump in here too, but I will just say that to add to Tyrone's testimony here that what people need to understand is that when those troopers came in, that negotiations were in full swing, that, that, the, that there was 28 demands that had been agreed to, that, that this thing could have been ended peacefully. And not only that, that when the state troopers came in, that they came in, we now know, we now know 45 years later, we found out that they deliberately did not give an ultimatum to those men inside that yard. That they deliberately did not give an ultimatum because they didn't want there to be a warning that, that, that there was that these men, when that gas was dropped, that it that it felled them, that people were vomiting, they were blinded, they were incapacitated when those guys came in with those guns blazing. And some men were shot, as Tyrone was saying, six, seven times, and then stripped naked, and then beaten. And, and, and so this is at a time when negotiations are going on, when people inside are basically saying, do not come in with force because it's gonna be a massacre. People like David Rothenberg. And, and so David, you should come in. And as an observer of all this, you saw this firsthand. Yeah, and Heather, two of the, I, I don't know how many, but I know of two of the men uh, were shot after they took over, uh, L.D. Barkley and uh, Sam Melville uh, were killed by the uh, troopers after they had taken over the institution. I, um, I had always, well, you know, after Attica, after those four days, those of us that were on the Attica observers, we started meeting weekly at, at uh, attorney Bill Kunstler's house. He was one of the people there to try to assess what happened. And I came to the conclusion, I think most of us did, that there was Congressman Badillo and Tom Wicker of the New York Times, Clarence Jones of the Amsterdam News and State Senator Robert Garcia. The feeling was that, and uh, Herman Badillo had made a plea to Governor Rockefeller, give us more time. And that's Wicker's book, a time to, there's always a time to die, is that Nelson Rockefeller made a calculated political choice that he was perceived as an Eastern liberal. He had aspirations of being a Republican nomination, nominee for president. And that the choices were political. But I'm, I'm, I'm getting too far away. I, 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 I want to give some indication or some telling of how I got there, which is kind of curious. I was probably the least likely person to ever end up in Attica during an uh, uprising. I had produced a prison drama in 1967. I'm, I was a theater person. From that drama, the Fortune Society wow. literally was created on the stage and it was it was not to be my chosen profession. I was working in the theater, but did start an organization that gave a voice to people who were incarcerated. And we had a little scratchy news, newsletter that was mimeographed and the uh, warden and, and Attica banned it, said it was revolutionary. It was hardly readable, much less revolutionary. And we got a lawyer, a, a, actually a, a law student, a Columbia named Stephen Chestakowski brought it to federal court and we won. And as a result of that, two of the men who turned out to be leaders in the Adam and the Attica uprising, Roger Champion and Herbert X. Blyden, began a very intense conversation, a conversation, a correspondence with me. And one of the things I discovered is that they were very politically sophisticated, and that um, that the thinking into a, a protest. First of all, there was. Uh, they, they started protests the year before when, when George Jackson was killed. And uh, there was a, uh, I think it was that summer when George Jackson was killed in Soledad. And, and um, there was a uh, hunger strike in a lot of the prisons, including Attica. And 
and two things I learned. One is that they were politically sophisticated, and one, and the other thing is that the prison always relied on racial hostility, that they maintained control by blacks and whites uh, being uh, pitted against each other. And that um, one of the things that changed is that the drug culture had a lot of people who had blacks and whites who knew each other, and they weren't going to be alienated from people that they knew from the streets when they got inside. That made that created a sense of unity that was unprecedented in the uh, in the correction system around the state. Um, but when I got the call from Arthur E, would I come up to Attica when we, you know we heard the news that and they were looking for observers? I was rather startled, but and I said I wasn't going to go alone. And two of the men who had from Fortune, Kenny Jackson and Mel Rivers, went with me. They had both formerly incarcerated men, and uh, the moment we walked into the yard, we were aware of the fact that rifles were pointed at us and I thought you know I had just started this small organization that was creating a voice for people who had been locked up and suddenly I had rifles pointed at me and I thought this is a different ball game this is this is it the hostages were down in front of us I met uh, Champ and Herbert Blyden and many of the brothers uh, that subsequently uh, and met se several who had died that day um, and we were going in and out, uh, you know, we'd sit for four or five hours and then we'd go back in and sort of summarize where we're at and then go back in. And I remember going outside and the townspeople were there and, and they were filled with hate and rumors. And the rumors were that there were busloads of black people coming up from Harlem that were gonna kill them. And of course there were no such, there was no such thing, but the, the community atmosphere was rather frightening. They were ready to, to kill us. Um, I. I, I had no impact other than what I observed in Attica. What I came away with though was life-changing. The fact that human lives were seen as so expendable that uh, the men there were seen as political pawns and what seemed the decisions that were being made from Albany had nothing to do with what was going on in Attica. And, uh, and, and particularly meeting with the Attic Observers Committee, hearing people who were politically sophisticated, like mm -hmm. Consular and Badillo and Garcia and Tom Wicker, Clarence Jones, um, John Dunn, who was a Republican who, who won it, who was a state senator. Uh, you, you got to, I, I learned more about the evils of prison and the fact that it was so contradictory to the needs of the community that people who had gone away because they were convicted of a crime were in a situation that was so alienating and so anti-human that they were coming back with, with greater anger. It seemed like it's such an exercise in futility that the prison system is really, in my eyes, and I was, that's what Attica did to me, made me realize that it was a, um, a contributor to violence and, and alienations in the community because people came out uh, so angry and so unprepared for re-entering into society, because as Tyrone pointed out, no programs, um, and, and education limited. So you go in with limitations and a crime and you come out uh, looking at a society that has allowed this to happen to you. And so uh, I think Attica sort of epitomized the whole futility and the evilness that's basic in our prison system. David, a um, couple of questions um, just to follow up with both you and Tyrone. First of all, um, were there were there any women on the uh, observers committee? No, 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 not at all. Okay, um, and and the number of people who were who died at Attica. Can we just establish that uh, that fact? Heather, do you have that, or do um, David, are you and Tyrone now? I didn't get the question, uh, Brent. The number of people who died that day, um, or that week. Uh, it was uh, off 30, the top. 39, Tyrone. I think 39 30, people. 30, 30, 39 people. 39 people. Yeah, 39 people. And, and I believe it was uh, 39 people, inclusive of that, was 10 uh, uh, correctional employees. And then there was that significant thing where the state and the department correction announced that the guards 
had their throats slashed by the inmates, the guards that were held hostage. And that story was page one around the world that the inmates, that the rioting inmates had slashed the throats of the hostage guards. And the next day, this quiet little coroner in Wyoming County said, no, they weren't. They were all killed by state bullets that went in their back. And the interesting thing that the press bought the uh, correction uh, release without any challenges, any questions, and they had to, and they had to go back. And, and, and part of it was rewriting that moment of history that the uh, state bullets shot the guards. Mm -hmm. And a lot mm -hmm. of the lawsuits, of course, subsequently came from the families of the guards that were killed by the state. And that is that is so that that fact is is so profoundly important, particularly when we think about the legacy of Attica. When we look back 50 years now, you know, it's really extraordinary when you think about the 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 reality that Attica was about how terrible the conditions were on the inside. And Attica's reality was that law enforcement came in and shot thousands of rounds of ammunition into a very, very small space after dropping canisters of CN and CS tear gas. Heather, they never had to shoot. The mace would have controlled exactly. The, the exactly. Mace controlled the the entire population. They did exactly. not have to shoot. So, the, so the reality was extraordinary uh, aggression and abuse of folks on the inside that had no firearms. But because state officials then stood out in in front of that prison and reported that the folks on the inside, that the prisoners had killed the hostages and had slit their throats and actually worse, had castrated one of the guards. And that not only had they done that, but that the prison officials said that they had seen this with their own eyes, that there was actually footage of this. And because no reporter chose to corroborate this because it just kind of fit their racial imaginary, this story went up, as David says, on the front page of the New York Times, the front page of the Los Angeles Times, the front page of countless small town newspapers because it went out on the AP Newswire. And we have to really understand how profoundly important that was in changing the course of American history because Remember that right in 1970, uh, you know, when, when, when Attica is inviting the news cameras in, in 1970, 1971, people are moved. I mean, people are like, are you kidding me? You can end up in Attica on a parole violation. You could be 21 years old and, and end up in a place like Attica for driving without a driver's license. Are you kidding me? I mean, a lot of Americans were really kind of taken aback by that. This was a profoundly important wake up call for a lot of America. But then they're told this lie and they're like, whoa, we were duped, we were, we were lied to. This isn't a civil rights uprising. This isn't about prisoner rights. This is about, this is about these aggressive, horrible human beings behind bars. You can look at the polling data and you can see that a generation of Americans, not everybody, not the people who really knew what was going on, but a generation of Americans all of a sudden gets, gets you know, swayed into this whole tough on crime stuff. And if you look at the mass incarceration rates, if you look at the graph of mass incarceration, it's not that those numbers just go up anytime. Those numbers skyrocket right after Attica. And I'm not saying Attica has everything to do with it, but I'm telling you, it's the lies told about Attica. It's the lies told about what happened at Kent State. It's the lies told about what happened in Chicago of 68. It's an extraordinary thing that in the 1960s, the preponderance of the violence is law enforcement, actual violence, right? The shootings, the, and yet somehow, if you look at the headlines, who's violent? The prisoners are violent. The students are violent. The hippies are violent. The women are violent. The women's movement's violent. Everybody. But so this lie matter, actually. This, what, this lie mattered a lot. What was significant is that, you know, Rockefeller's role, some, one of the, somebody about him, was it political? Right after this came the Rockefeller drug law in New yes. York, 
and emulated around the country, which, which is part of what escalated the prison population. Yes. And it was selectively used on black and Hispanic uh, That's right. people. And we could, we could watch whatever young black males, what drug was in was being heralded as the most frightening thing that was, that was happening on the streets. And the white kids at the same time, as they should have been, were going into treatment centers, but the black kids were going to jail. And we, yes. we, we were witness to that. And that, that no, all came out of Attica. I, I, just, I just want to interject because the two particular points that, that was prevalent. On the 14th, I believe the 14th or 15th of September, 1971, I was in the hospital in Attica. Uh, I went to Meyer Memorial Hospital for a day uh, in Buffalo, and I was brought right back to uh, Attica Hospital. Doctors, I should say, did a fantastic job on me. And I remember laying up in my hospital bed with uh, bandaged all up, and there was a lot of people coming through. A lot of politicians was coming through, and it was coming by talking. That's how you feel. I was a real little reluctant to talk to anybody. But what got me on that day, this one particular day, on the 15th of September, I'll never forget it. There was a prison guard that came into the ward and he was calling his colleague and he was shaking. And I believe he had a copy of um, the Buffalo, uh, Buffalo Evening Post. I don't know if I'm correct on the name. And he said, Jesus, listen, the coroner from, Rock, from Rochester is saying, that none of the guys, none of the guys, I, I remember distinctly what he said, none of the guys had their throat slit. They was all shot. And I seen the reaction of the keeper. And I said, wow, you shot your own. I remember saying that to him, you shot your own, you know, and they were shaking. Tyron, there was another thing that was happening. I don't I don't know if this is generally known, the state was not telling families, uh, the, the loved ones of inmates were trying to find out who was alive, who was dead, and yeah. they couldn't find it. Sure. And we finally got that information. I don't know who got it to us. And we at Fortune Society, we were calling the families to let them know who's safe, who's dead. It was, it was a horrible experience having to tell people that their love, that their son or their brother was dead, but the state wouldn't even give the families the the dignity of knowing the status of, of what happened, whether there's somebody who was alive or dead or wounded, and where they were. It was, and I remember we've talked to people that were involved on the phones those days. We've talked about that for years. That it was such an emotional trauma to have, the, and that the state abandoned their responsibility in sharing. It's a I share that only because having witnessed that, I, I realized that it, it's not generally known. It was just one more. It's an asterisk in the evilness of that whole that whole era. You know, it is important. I do want to, before we do run out of time, I do want to mention, though, um, that, that amidst all of this, and I know that Ter Tyrone and David will appreciate <laughs> this as well, that despite all that evil, um, there was, from the, from the very minute this happened, there were people all across this country that, that didn't accept this and, and stepped up and, and just showed up at, at, on the doorstep of Attica in droves. And I know that you all can talk about that too, because that's a really important part of this story which is the legacy of that resistance to this. You know, even though the state of New York refused to ever indict troopers for anything that went down at Attica, and even though they went after uh, prisoners, and that had a terrible legacy, right? Because it sent this message that everything that went wrong at Attica was never about law enforcement. But at the same time, there was this is a story about the most extraordinary legal defense effort in American history. I really believe that. Yes. I mean, you're talking about more people showed up and brothers defended themselves in court. Young lawyers, young law students showed up There's from things. every There's small town and city. Yes. It was incredible. And these people are all coming together this year on the 50th to commemorate the the real you know 
the real standing up, and, and this is where a lot of the women came into the story. You asked how many women were involved. I mean, this is people like, you know, Elizabeth Fink, Liz Gaines. I mean, all of these people who came together afterwards and really stood up to make sure that that people were protected afterwards, right? I mean, can you all talk a little bit about that? I wonder if Tyrone knew that um, shortly afterwards that there was a candlelight march that started in the village and went up to Harlem. It was the burial of four unclaimed bodies and yeah. hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, maybe thousands, marched by candlelight. It was one of the most dramatic things I've seen. And that's reflecting on what you said, Heather, about that people did come together and they, and they saw the humanity. The other thing is that some of the people that were in Attica, that when they came out, were incredible human beings. People like Herbert X. Blyden and Joe Little did. And I, I mean, there are so many who did such extraordinary things. They, they were great men, and uh, they and who knows about those that were killed? What they what they could have contributed when they came back. You know, we, we have um, a number of questions that are coming in, but I do want to. Um, I, I, I always like to say that history is a resource for understanding our own times. Do you think Attica, and, and Heather has talked about this a little bit already, but which, where are we, which direction are we going in? Are we going in the direction that, that can contribute to a, a similar uprising in the future? Or are we moving in a, in a different direction as a, as a society as, uh, or in New York State, even just to talk to New, about New York State? But I know Heather, you're looking at that national. Can I issue. can I expand on that to a certain extent? Yeah, please, extent, Karen. Right? Yes, Brent, Can I expand? And you know what? Don't limit it. Don't limit it to the prison. Don't do that. We make mistakes by doing that. And 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 and, and I get somewhat paranoid about that. And and the reason why I said that, the reason why I say that, because um, in uh, fifty years ago. 50 years ago, I was called an insurrectionist. I was called a rebel. And, and yes, I'll admit I was a Black Panther. and have no problem saying it today, 50 years later. Oh, what about those guys that was on the Capitol steps in January? What about those guys? What about those guys? Those was insurrectionists. And as a matter of fact, they killed a few people down there. Yeah. See, so let's talk about the balancing Let's talk about the real balancing. Unfortunately, I did 29 years in prison. I seen uh, the metamorphosis. When I came to prison, there was 11,000 people in New York State locked up, 11,000. Mm -hmm. When I left prison, there was close to 80,000 people locked up. And the majority of them looked just like me. Why did that happen? Prison became an industrial complex for people that could not get work in the urban, in the, in the rural sections of, of New York State. And that's something that people do not want to admit to. That whole Rockefeller drug thing, that was nothing but game. Get money for people who ordinarily would not be, who would be highly unemployed. Close a prison down in one of those communities in New York State, and you have a you have a rebellion on your hand from people that's out of work. We've seen it over and over again. So which, Aaron, we're seeing something now that was very similar to that, and that was locking up black people. The result of Dr. King's voting registration. Oh wow! When there we you go. lock up hundreds of thousands of people across the country, you are reducing their political power, and it's exactly what's being emulated today in a much more politically evil and sophisticated manner. Yes, but look, but look, once again, once again, you know, if we look, if we go back historically and what wasn't brought out in this conversation was the conversations that we acquired later on that Rockefeller had with old Tricky Dick, with Nixon. Tricky Dick, the first question that Tricky Dick asked Rockefeller was the black guys doing it. Right. And Rockefeller said yes. And he had no qualms of saying, well, go and do what you got to do. And what was his reward? Becoming the vice president of the United States. So let's don't forget these that issues. That was all part of it. But you know, on a, on, a, on a current scale, why is it, and particularly in so many of what's called the red states, people who have been formerly incarcerated lose their right to vote forever. 
and in Florida they had a referendum that changed it, and then the and then the state legislature uh, inserted something that said you have to pay your fine before whatever the fine was before yeah. you have the right to vote. It, it it's um, there is some evil and very clever people that are doing a lot of political manipulation, and it's and it's. I'll be right uh, back. I'll be right back. Yeah. But don't I, leave, know, I, don't leave us, Tyrone. No, no, I, 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 two minutes, two minutes. David, David, maybe you can reflect on this. Do you think the trend um, at, that Tyrone described of the mass incarceration of these past 50 years, although I know some, some prisons in New York have been closing, um, which, where are we going? Is this- Well, uh, in New York, it was reduced, but the, uh, certainly the pandemic, it, it, right now, the whole thing is more cops on the street without dealing, for example, at the Fortune Society, we had an ATI program, alternative incarceration, 175 mostly teenagers who came to us rather than going to jail. But for a full year, they've had, it's all been virtual. And so you have youngsters around the country, most at risk, with no programs, no jobs, no schools, no social interaction because everything is closed. Um, I, I'm not surprised that there's an increase in crime. Um, the answer is uh, uh, cops on the street, more cops on the street gives the perception of a, a, a comfort to the population. But unless you deal with the fact that, uh, the, and I don't, it's the pandemic that you have thousands and thousands of the mostly at risk kids uh, you can't you can't deal with humanity virtually the way you do, you know the, the way we have with jobs mm -hmm. uh, I always say that at, at places like fortune it has a hugging culture young people who have never been a part of anything to feel that they are connected emotionally with other people that's been taken away not just by us but by hundreds of similar programs around the country. It's a very dangerous uh, time for us. Uh, and why vaccinations are a political issue at this time, yeah. because we have to get yeah. people back to interacting. Let, let me, let me um, uh, refer to a, a few of the questions. And then I, I have, I want to uh, make sure to ask uh, Heather about this program at the University of, of Michigan on, um, on documenting criminalization and confinement because that's, that's uh, something I'd like to know more about. But um, can anyone talk about what the, this is a question from an anonymous uh, attendee. What did the chaplains do during the uprising? Can anyone speak to that? I think Ty Tyrone would probably be the best. Uh, okay, we'll wait for him to come back. I think the whole I'll question is what has religion's role been in prisons traditionally? Too yeah. often, I mean, we I've gotten to know the exceptional chaplains who have made, who have become uh, very apparent, but mostly they are part of the system. Another question, uh, of the 28 demands, how many are still not met or how many were met? Can, oh, um, the 28 demands this that were made really, by the This is a really interesting question. Um, you know, on paper, uh, there are there was a lot of improvements in um, the prison system because officially a lot of things changed, not just in New York, but I think across the country. I mean, everything from visiting rules over time to medical conditions, things, a lot of Supreme Court cases happened, Estelle versus Gamble, you know, guaranteeing better medical conditions in prisons. There's a lot of things that happened in the 1960s and 70s, and as a result of prison protests, lawsuits, um, that that really did markedly make a difference. But it, or I should say, the problem is that with mass incarceration, and the more punitive and the more uh, really hard-hearted and punitive American system prison and about the incarcerated in general, conditions have deteriorated, you know, tremendously behind bars. And we have really failed to deal with it. As much as we talk about criminal justice reform in this country, there has been really a stunning lack of attention to the actual conditions that people behind 
the walls experience. We talk a lot about collateral consequences. We talk a lot about things like, you know, what this, what this is experienced like outside of the walls as we should, but for what it actually looks like inside, how much solitary confinement people are doing, uh, what the medical conditions are really like, what the food is really, you know, how hot people's cells are, um, you know, it, it, just the literal conditions. It is abominable right now. And, and you know, it, it is something we have got to start talking about for all of the reasons we've talked about today, which is that if, if you want a safer society, you cannot even remotely imagine that this is the way that you accomplish it. And, and one of the things that we have to really talk about is that anyone who thinks that the system is working, of course, is really not being honest with themselves because the people who constantly would vote for it or even the, the, the highest level politicians who are constantly supporting it, of course, when their own children would fall afoul of the law or, you know, or, or have drug addiction problems or whatever, the absolute last place they would want their children to go would be to prison, right? I mean, it, it, the, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, the people with the highest level of resources in this country, the, the, the most control over their own lives, when they have problems, when they have, you know, when, they're, when their own family members fall afoul of the law, it's amazing how supportive they are of things like restorative justice, uh, counseling, resources, uh, because they know it works better, right? Uh, they, in fact, are deep believers. They are deep believers in things like community, uh, you know, uh, all the things that, that in fact, uh, other countries uh, do better than we do because they don't believe actually that prisons work. They they do know that that they're unsafe and and terribly run and all of those things. So so we just have to start, I think, as a society, telling the truth uh, about what people actually already know, and and, uh, and that's sort of I think our challenge for the next fifty years after Attica. Heather, there, there's also the economic part. We have in New York State, for example. Black kids keeping white men upstate in jobs. And I think we have to be creative and find job alternatives in rural communities. A town like Cooperstown doesn't need a prison because they have the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, there are some of the prisons there that if we created jobs, we could have many more alternative programs and maintain people in the community so that they don't get worse in the care of the State Department of Correction, but you have union, correction officer unions and whole communities who exist on the basis of their prison town. And so mm -hmm. social scientists have to be, I think, you know, of all people, Cynthia Nixon, when she was running for governor, had plans for job creations in prison towns. It didn't get much play and she didn't win many votes on it, but it was kind of fascinating to hear it. But I know that um, when you're describing conditions, um, Heather and a member of our uh, board at the Sing Sing Prison Museum, you may know Sean Pika, uh, who heads the uh, Hudson Link for Higher Education in Prison. And I know Tyrone, you received a, uh, a college degree. How, how- um, Pataki how cut it out, you? Pataki stopped it. And it had the lowest re recidivist rate was so low. And then for 20 years, they had no college program. Yeah. And now that's supposed to start up again. Well, Tyrone, how, how big a difference did that make in, in your life? Well, you know, acquiring a, acquiring a degree in prison was like, you know what? It was, first of all, it was something else to do. That right. was my mindset. But once I got into Marist College, the good old Jesuit school, and had those Jesuit uh, instructors and professors says, I'm not going to treat you no different than if you was on campus in Poughkeepsie. You had you options, Tyrone. You had yeah. options then. That's it became it a challenge. Yeah. And I decided to, and I decided to go the full way with it. And the utilization of that uh, you know, academic achievements, and not pat myself on the back, it was very good to me. Not only from the employment standpoint, but looking for, looking at the world from a very clear perspective once mm -hmm. I was released from prison. Exactly. Do you, do you think that, uh, oh, go ahead, David. 
Yeah. Well, he, he had a college education and, and not going back. Uh, they, they need people going back. The recidivist rate keeps people employed. Uh, it, it's subtle, but it's, it's lethal. It is. It is. Uh, Tyrone, while you were you were away uh, for a couple minutes, a question came in about the role of chaplains uh, during the uh, uprising. Can you talk about that at all? Any any comment? You mentioned about going to Marist College, but during the uprising. Well, what, during the uprising, I seen. I, I, only time I would go to church in in prison in Attica was to see somebody from a different block, a different <laughs> cell. Like I said. <laughs> Everything was segregated, and and and, and the, the preacher or the pastor that was there, he was just an entity within the prison. It's not like, um, I would say the pastor or the preacher that was in Green Haven, uh, uh Ed Ed Mueller. Mueller, yeah, when I came knew down it. to Green Haven yeah. in '92, he wasn't like him. It wasn't like that guy. There. He was just a guy there that went through the homily of everything else uh, of the church, and that was it. But it was after the fact. Tyron, that's my point. Everybody in the system knew Ed Muller that at Greenhaven, this was a man that created, he had discussion groups and, and support systems and outside reaching that everybody longed to be a part of what he did because, uh, and that shows you what somebody from the cloth can bring into the system. Uh, yes. They don't buy into it. And Ed Muller, isn't it interesting, you brought him up and I, and I was thinking of him before when I was thinking there were a few that there was Father O'Brien in, in Napanok, too, that yes. people know about. Yes. You know, I, I, I want to, um, we're, not, we're going to close in a, a couple of minutes, but I think this question that was brought up, and it's been in the chat as well, about the role of the media, um, and, and Heather mentioned it right from the beginning, the distortions that were uh, pervasive and that went around the world and and the corrections oh people oh, the the corrections always appear on page eight or page nine of of the newspaper but wh where is their reliable information today I know the Marshall Project does an excellent job but I'm also interested in the research that that you're doing uh, Heather at the University of Michigan on this uh, documenting criminalization and and um, and confinement. Uh, I think there are some academic research projects that are worth uh, uh, knowing about. Well, there are there are there are a number of really good sources of information. The Marshall Project is so good in no small part because it takes the words and the uh, perspectives of uh, returning citizens, formerly incarcerated people, so seriously. I mean, it it's. It actually asks people who know the truth of what's going on, what's going on. So that's why the Marshall Project is so important. Uh, the project at Michigan that we're trying to do documenting criminalization and confinement basically looked around at our state of affairs in this country. We have more people locked up now in this country than ever before in American history and more than any other country on the planet. And we basically likened it to uh, you know, a, a crisis unlike any other and decided it was time that we start actually documenting it in real serious ways uh, from the perspective of those who have experienced it most directly. So we have trying to do some oral history projects of people who have experienced criminalization, policing, uh, incarceration from, from, you know, every perspective. We're trying to create a massive archive because our hope is that in a hundred years, people are gonna look back on this and ask what the hell happened, try to make sense of it so that it never happens again. And right now uh, we know that we're gonna want them to hear what happened from the perspective of those who uh, suffered it most directly. So we want there to be uh, a real record of it. And um, so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, Columbia University Square One project is trying to do things. UCLA has the COVID project where they're documenting how this has ravaged prisons in real time so that there's a real record of that. Uh, there's a Texas prison project that's trying to figure out what's going on there. So there's a lot of real work going on to try to document this. We can, you know, it's there if people want to look for it, but the media does play a really important role because as long as we have television shows like Lock Up Raw or, oh. you know, these horrendous, you know, fuel the 
flames of, you know, prisoners or animals and, you know, and people don't have rights and, you know, and fuel the fame, the, the fear mongering, we lose all reality and we forget how way out of whack we are. We, you know, we, we, we can't lock up any more people than we are. Uh, and we just have to you know, get some balance here. And if we get, you know, we get confused, we just have to kind of take it back to our own homes and say to ourselves, if my child, even if my own child killed somebody, what would I want to happen, right? Uh, would I want them to take responsibility? Of course. Would I want them to somehow remedy it? Of course. But would I want them to be tortured? Would I want them to be locked away forever? Would I want them to be killed? Would I want, no. You would want something that would make the situation better and God help you, you wouldn't want them to do it again and you wouldn't want them to be worse. So what would make the society safer? And if you just bring it home, we can figure this thing out. Other countries have figured it out. Other societies have figured it out. We can figure it out. Let's do it. You know, you know, just to, just to feed into that, just a, a minute. One of the things that we constantly read about, because I was in segregation for a very long time in Attica, and we read Drosikowski. And I'm paraphrasing Drosikowski. Um, I think he said... Uh, the prison is a reflection of your society. The degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. There you that, go. That, and it's, it's still prevalent today what? in 2021. Well, can you I, know. Um, can I thank you all for letting us have this? Um, you know, it's been 50 years and so few of the people, the Attica brothers and Attic observers are alive. So I feel like I, I think uh, Tyron probably feels the same way. We have a greater responsibility talking for so many people who have gone. So I appreciate the opportunity to, that you have given us for this. Well, I, we, we appreciate uh, the time you're, you're giving us to, to spend. And um, I am reminded of um, when you mentioned Dostoevsky, the, de Tocqueville had some of the same observations when he visited uh, the United States. Um, Thomas Mott Osborne, who was the inspiration for the Osborne Association, yes. asked the question a hundred years ago: um, Are should our prisons be human repair shops or or scrap heaps? And and the whole question of why do we have prisons? And I think Heather articulated that as well. What is the purpose? What what are we? Is it is it revenge or uh, retribution or is it reform and and rehabilitation? We have had a couple of questions just before we close about the name of the book. So I will hold it up again. Blood in the Water, the Attica Prison Uprising of, of uh, 1971 and its legacy. Heather Ann Thompson, David Rothenberg, Tyrone Larkins. I know we could keep going on and on, but you've suggested a number of really important questions. And I hope that the Sing Sing Prison Museum is going to be a very different kind of museum that will be a platform for these kind of conversations that connects our history as a resource for understanding our own times. So thanks okay. again Thank to you. Thank all you. Brett, Brett, I'll be in contact with you sometime this week. Good. Thank, Thank you, you all. Take care, Tyrone and David. Thank you, Brent.